If you are a regular listener to The Sociology Show, then you could help with the costs of promoting and hosting the podcast. If you can spare even a small amount, then you can donate on the GoFundMe.com website by searching for The Sociology Show. There is no obligation, of course, and all future downloads will continue to be free. A huge thank you to all those that have already donated. Your kind gesture will help to continue keep the show going and growing. Best wishes and keep enjoying the show. Hi, you're listening to The Sociology Show, a podcast about absolutely anything to do with the wonderful world of sociology. Whether you're a teacher, a lecturer, a student, or just taking a passing interest, this podcast will look at a range of issues from social class, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, religion, crime, education, and anything else that sociology has to offer. My name is Matthew Wilkin, and in each episode, I will speak to someone working in the field of sociology and let them explain all about their own interests, their research, and their experiences. So, put your earphones in, turn the volume up, and let's be sociology geeks together, eh? Hello and welcome to The Sociology Show. The Sociology Show podcast is brought to you, as ever, in association with tutor to you Sociology, the exam performance specialist for A-level and GCSE sociology students and teachers. And so you can visit tutor to younet forward slash sociology and there you can pick up things like revision guides and flashcards, revision videos and everything else that you need for your A-level or GCSE sociology studies. And so I am delighted to welcome my guest for this episode, the author of Gang Leader for a Day, Sadir Venkatesh. Sadir, thank you for joining me. Thank you for the invitation. It's good to be here. Thank you. Now, a lot of listeners will already know a huge amount about you already, but I thought it would still be good for you just to tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Uh, Sure. So I am a a faculty member in the Department of Sociology at Columbia University, and I've been here for 21 years now. And I am otherwise known as an ethnographer, which is um, which means that I spend an inordinate amount of time with people in the role of what I call a professional stranger, um, just observing their daily life. Brilliant. Thank you. And uh, your ethnographic work will certainly be discussed during this as well. I thought it'd be quite interesting for people to know a little bit about your background as well. You, you were born in India, but moved to the States quite young. Is that right? That is correct. My father came here uh, when I was, well, uh, excuse me, my father came here when I was two. And then I came here when I was, uh, came to the U.S. when I was five from India and have been living here ever since. Great. And then, so you studied sociology in the States? I began by studying mathematics. Ah. It was a um, compromise between my father, who wanted me to be a bioengineer, and um, I had fallen in love with the social sciences, and I think he felt as though it would be very difficult back then for the son of an immigrant in this country to become employed (laughs) without a technical degree. So we settled on mathematics, and then I just went to graduate school for sociology. And that's interesting you say that, actually, because I know at certain parts of the book, you've, you've always considered yourself very much an ethnographer and the, the qualitative approach rather than quantitative, right? Yeah, and I actually started my, my training in mathematics, and then uh, I was working on a master's in cognitive science. So I spent the first part of my career in graduate study on the quantitative side. And when I went to the University of Chicago, I was planning on being a mathematical sociologist. I was not, I had no previous exposure, or I should say I had no previous experience with qualitative methods. It kind of fell on me. Uh, So, and um, it was a happy accident. And should we get into Gang Leader for a Day straight away? Because that's what the listeners all want to hear about. So it's a very, very famous study. People may have either read the the book itself or maybe via Freakonomics as well. But should we start right from the beginning? How did it all start, Sadeh? Well, if if, if I have to tell an origin story, I suppose I would start with a set of conversations I had when I landed at the University of Chicago in which I expressed an interest in studying the suburbs. Now, mind you, you have to put yourself back in, uh, you know, this this occurred some time ago in 1989. So this is, these are not recent events in, in that sense of the term. I really wanted to look at 
the transformation of suburban America, much as a an author at that time named Mike Davis, who was just a popular writer, uh, kind of a Marxist historian, uh, was looking at the transformation of the working class in America. And when I arrived at the University of Chicago, I was met with a fair degree of, I wouldn't say resistance, but just skepticism. Most faculty that I spoke with felt as though there wasn't really anything interesting to study in terms of the American middle class. So I uh, turned my attention to looking at something that the American middle class at that time were obsessed with, and that was the urban poor. And I wanted to begin by trying to understand the ways in which the poor were related to other institutions in American society. So not necessarily diving into a community study, which I suppose it ended up in a way, but instead trying to think of the poor as part of America. So what if we didn't situate them as an island or, um, you know, a, a sea that a, or a colony and all these kinds of metaphors, but rather just an, another American community? Um, and so that led me to doing some field work, um, to some kind of unforeseen encounters with uh, street gangs, and, and which I'm happy to go into. But I just wanted to, I thought I would give you that preamble because many people think that I have some um, explicit intention of going into the Robert Taylor Homes housing development, living there with families, and, and I never really did. And so was it, it was kind of your first piece of research, is that right? I, I think it was the first piece of research that I did myself by myself. To that point, I was working in labs with faculty members, and it was very different. So just to give you a sense of how different it was, you know, I ended up living with families and observing interaction uh, ethnographically. So I didn't start that way. I started in a lab uh, looking at how people of different race and ethnic backgrounds made sense of uh, there's this, how they acquired a sense of society. So we were looking at six years old, six year olds, and seven year olds. And when I say acquired a sense of society, the, the, what we would do is we would run this little experiment. We would give them little flashcards. And the flashcards were in a particular order. And they had a little cartoon image on them, on them. It was a little sketch. A young man walks up to a river. He is the first card. The second card, he pulls a picture of a woman out of his pocket. The third card, he rips up that picture. The fourth card, he throws it away. The fifth card, he dives into the ocean or the, the body of water. We'd show it to kids of different ethnic race and class backgrounds and ask them just, you know, what is this story? And we try to get a sense of how they made sense of images and kids from different backgrounds would say different things about that story. One would say, oh, this person's sad. They lost a friend. Others would say they committed suicide. And, and so we were trying to understand how it is that children acquire a sense of the social world in, in, in a meaningful way, such that they can take images and cast them in a meaningful light in narratives. And I only tell you that because that's where I began in terms of research. I thought research was a very divorced activity that one did behind computers and in labs. And so my first study diving into a community where it was very amorphous and vague and one had to build relationships and such with people and get them to talk to you and build trust. I never had any experience doing that. And so what, what took you to the Robert Taylor Homes? How did you decide on that as a venue or a location to conduct your research? It was partly accidental. The, the University of Chicago, like many universities at that time in the U.S. and, and probably in some other Western democracies, I would imagine, uh, constituted an island. And it was a, it was a fortress that existed um, in a kind of unchanging way, meaning that the grounds of the university were, were relatively the same, while the neighboring communities were changing dramatically. And at that time, the neighboring areas changed from a predominantly white ethnic population, Jews, Italians, Irish, Germans, to um, an African-American population. And so right outside my door were very poor black communities. And it was relatively stark, the contrast. And some of the early education that you received as a grad student at the university at the time warned you to stay away from those communities, you know, and I must have been in my early 20s. So naturally, if somebody tells you at that age not to do something, 
right? That's the first thing you're going to do. Yeah. So I started walking around those neighborhoods and, and just meeting some just lovely people. And, and I kept wondering, what is the source of fear here? What, what's, what's going on? Why, are, why, why doesn't anybody want me to be here? And then I, then I stumbled upon these street gangs and eventually I befriend, befriended them. And um, the leader took, uh, you, know, you know, the story. It, 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 became, it became, I don't know if it was a friendship, but a, a long-term mutual acquaintance developed. And that's how it led to the study. I've got to ask you because it's one of the most fascinating bits. It, you know, your first encounter, your opening question, your opening question is just absolutely fantastic. Do you want to say a little bit about that? Sure. So, can I give you a little background as to yeah, how that came? Yeah, please do. Yeah, I was very anxious and um, insecure, and as a grad student, at least when I was starting out, but probably continuously so. And I was thrust into the research lab of William Julius Wilson. William Julius Wilson at that time already was an eminent sociologist of poverty and inequality. And I found that I had very little to offer people in this lab. And the more that I, the more that I tried to find a niche, the less successful I was. And, and finally, uh, as as we know him, Bill Wilson, Bill and others said, you know, you should go and just carry out a study and just start, start somewhere. So I wrote a survey and said, well, let me go and try to understand life in some of these neighborhoods and what I thought I would do because nobody was really asking people how they felt about their life. They were asking them questions about their use of uh, food stamps or social welfare or some of the challenges, but no one really just simply asked them <laughs> what would, what were your daily conditions like and, um, and, you know, getting their sentiments and emotions. So I constructed a short survey and I went out and, um, and used some of the questions that, that were pre-existing. And then I devised some of my own, such as this first one, which is how does it feel to be black and poor? Mind you, I had no experience writing interview instruments, so I just thought, well, if you want to, if you really want to know something, why don't you just ask someone directly? Uh, so that's where that question came from. But it ended up obviously being a very um, loaded question, maybe, maybe also a silly question, but certainly loaded. Um, and I learned a lot about um, the politics of asking certain questions by by doing that. The, the reason I think is it's brilliant is because it's kind of it's kind of the question that people really want to ask, but are too afraid to say. And I don't know if it's because you're quite a young sociologist and, and please don't af- take offense by this, but there's a certain naivety to your initial research, but actually you get exactly what you were looking for. Yeah. You know, when, when I, when I started doing the book tour for gang leader for a day, people said, how did you come up upon this construct? You know, I, there, there were a lot of people who were very interested in literary tropes and wanted to know, you know, you, you devised this trope of a naif, Who's who doesn't know what they're doing and and is you know a, a deer in the headlights? You know where did you decide upon that? And I thought, well, I didn't really have much of a choice. <laughs> That's sort of how it happened. I didn't know what I was doing, and I learned through a series of failures and mistakes, and through the tremendous generosity of people who helped me learn. Uh, so, you know, that, that's I, I feel extremely fortunate that I was able to meet people who let me stumble and fall and pick me up again. And we'll, we'll be a bit careful with language today, but what were the first reactions when you asked that question? What's it like to be black and poor? Well, just, I mean, essentially people thought it was the silliest, stupidest question that anyone could ask. Um, yeah, meaning if you, it's kind of a question that has a double mind, right? If If you, know the answer to the question, you really don't need to ask. If you don't know the answer to the question, you shouldn't be asking. You should, you should know, or, or meaning you should have some sense. So it, the, 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 the fact that you would have to ask it in that way itself tells you the answer to the question, meaning the, a key part of the problem is that I, by asking the question, feel that I'm just very removed from their life. And I think that's just what I think they were laughing at and just ridiculing me by saying, you know, you live a mile away and yet you have to ask us or you're the sociologist, you're the expert on inequality and you want to know what it's like to be poor. How do you think it is? You know, so there was a there was a feeling that 
uh, I was met with, with, with in some sense chiding me for being silly enough to formulate that question in that way. And should we talk about that first period? Because quite a dramatic first period to, once you got involved with the Black Kings gang, right? Sure. Yeah. Um, how do you, what, what, what would you like to focus on? Well, what, what, what happened over that first period of time? Because obviously, once you met the gang, you, you were quickly introduced to JT, the leader, right? Yes. And, and then slowly, I started to uh, extend my sphere of contacts outside his group and his influence. But that wasn't so easy. You know, in, in this kind of research, any ethnographer who does what, what we call participant observation, they may never talk, they may not talk about it so openly, and they rarely write about it, unfortunately. But y- you're beholden to people, just, just as many of us are now. You know, you walk into a dinner party that you already don't know anyone, or you walk into a, a scene where you, you, or it's a new community for you and someone has invited you. You, you're kind of dependent a, a little bit on, on other people to speak for you, to vouch for you, and to help you. It's no different in being an ethnographer. I think people have a sense of the ethnographer who goes and studies foreign communities as being invisible. You're never invisible. You're never invisible in real life. And so early on in that first stage, I think one of the things that I always, I always remember and recall very vividly is the challenge of just getting away from this very powerful figure so that I could experience other people's viewpoints and opinions, because this person also had a stake in me being there. It was a sign of status to be able to bring somebody who looked very different and who was from a very elite, powerful institution and be able to hold them up figuratively in the community and say, this scholar, this graduate student, this extern, this outsider is interested in me. And I think he wanted to cultivate that. So the first period, I, one of the things that I recall is just how challenging it was for me to move outside his orbit. He seems quite a magnetic personality, JT. He had a college degree, and that always struck you, didn't it, that you were quite surprised by that at the time? Yes, because sociologists are not immune to the stereotypes of the object that they study. And I mean that in several senses, that we are there to unpack, to debunk, and to discover alternative ways to educate the public beyond the stereotypes, all of which are noble. However, we are still susceptible as human beings to the very stereotypes that we are you know, trying to grapple with in a scholarly way. So at a core level, everyone that I knew uh, at the university that I was speaking to generally had the same feeling that I did, which is, this is a group of people that is uneducated, undereducated, et cetera. Now, those are gross generalizations, but and those are gen, those are statements that you would make at a level of a population. But you know, when you meet an individual person, they become a representative of that population. So you don't often make a co- switch in a mental switch and say, "Okay, this person might not look. This person might not ex- fit exactly into the statistical." norm or the statistically average de- description of, of, you know, the, of people who live in this area. So I was, that's a long-winded and awkward way of saying that I was as susceptible to anyone to these stereotypes, and one of which is that I would probably not meet that many high up, uh, people who had gone through college and certainly not meet someone who was running a street gang who had that background. And so I, f- I just found that to be something that needed to be explained. Yeah. Understandable, definitely. And the bit that students are always fascinated and interested in, a gun held to your head, held hostage overnight. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because that, that's always the bit that students get quite excited by. Yeah, and I, and I realise that in print it can sound pretty exciting, but I, yeah. you know, I, I do want to try to put you back in that space where I was sitting. So... I'm in front of a building that was abandoned, and I didn't really understand it. So I'm there with a list of families to interview, 
and this is a building that was on the that was that was um, cited for for upcoming demolition or at least for closure because it was not up to code and there was a series of political controversies in what we call public housing council housing in the uk and and so there was a reticence or at least a, a you know, there was there was some suspicion about people who were coming into this neighborhood, and so when I walked in, trying to uh, trying to understand where to find particular kinds of families, um, people looked at me very skeptically, and the there was there's there's very little police presence, and so that kids in the neighborhood who are in the gang are your effect are effectively your security force. So they asked me some questions, and they had no, they didn't know what I was doing, and that this was in the context of some street gang wars in which there were active drive-by shootings, in which gangs would come into this community from other territories, and you have to also picture that I looked like, a, you know, I had very long hair and a braid, and I was wearing probably, you know, it might have been cold at that time, but still, I probably had some sort of insignia that that revealed that I was interested, and I was basically a hippie in training. And so I did not look like the average person walking around. And to say that I was there to ask questions was not only so it was it was a source of suspicion because the only people who ask questions are cops and journalists, mm-hmm. neither of whom a street gang wants to see roaming around their neighborhood. And when they when they retained me, you know, just asking me to wait until their leader came, and I didn't. I am, I'm not kidding you. I, I thought, well, maybe this is like a tenant leader. Maybe this is a, you know, a person who has the keys to the doors or something like that. You know, I, so I just, I just sat there and observed them. And slowly they started to taunt me, and then I, and I said, okay, well, I guess they're just having fun. These might be, these must just be kids. So, you know, it was. I suppose it was fearful, but it's fearful in the sense that you're not really sure if this is comedy and people are that you're or if this is something that's serious and so that it was i think i would have benefited from not being fully aware of my circumstances um you know the other important thing to note is that i had grown up in the suburbs i had grown up in a fairly affluent community in california so you know, I might have read about this, but nothing. I had no tactile way of understanding what it means to have a gun pointed at you or a knife pointed at you. This was all as comedic as it was threatening. Um, so I, I, I say it in that way because a highly stylized version would have me either, you know, tearing off my shirt, revealing some sort of Superman badge, or cowering in the corner. And I'm not sure I was doing either of the two. I think I was just standing there wondering, what movie is this in? And I'm just kind of curious to know how it ends. And it certainly didn't put you off because you came back the next day, right? <laughs> yeah, and, and that's that's what I mean. I think sometimes ambition comes with certain blinders. I mean, I I didn't. I wouldn't say that I had the ambition to to succeed as a graduate student or to be a star or anything like that. I just wanted to fit in. I just wanted to be able to make a contribution to uh, Professor Wilson's lab and and have a successful graduate career. And as soon as I saw that these folks were essentially inviting me to come back to their community, I jumped at the chance because up to that point, there was nobody else telling me, we want you to come back and hang out with us. So I, I, I didn't want to let that chance drop. Yeah, understandable. Too good an opportunity to miss. And you've mentioned a little bit about your, your methodology, your research, but that's something that listeners are really keen to know. Um, what, what other methods did you use as you collected your data? You know, I, I, I imagine most people will be familiar with Gang Leader, but not know the first book that I wrote. So the first book that I wrote was called American Project. And that was the more scholarly version of the field work that I conducted for the popular book, which is Gang Leader for a Day. In that more scholarly version, I ended up writing a history, you know, like a 30, 40 year, 50 year history of this particular housing development. And I want to mention that because at the time, uh, both in the UK and in the US, there was a field of social science that crossed that that intersected um, anthropology and history brought those two together 
and it was represented in the work of people such as John and Jean Komaroff or Marshall Solins. And the, the methodological innovation at that time was to think about using events as moments to understand how history uh, can be seen in a community that in some official sense has no history. So when you go to a public housing development in the U.S., there's no historical archive there waiting for you with documents and photos of every year, et cetera. So how are you going to write the history? So I became interested in this question because every time I spoke to somebody, whether they were 12 years old or whether they were 80 years old, history really shaped how they acted. You know, life isn't like, life isn't like it used to be, or if an event happened, an act of violence, they immediately knew how to act because they had gone through it many times or heard about it many times, or there were norms about how these conflicts should be resolved that were historical in nature. And so the sense that they had a history, that history was important for them, made me wonder, how am I going to get at that? How am I going to find ways to uncover that if there's no archive, if I can't go to the National Gallery and start poking around the archives? So I turned to this school of anthropology and history because what they essentially instructed me to do was to look at events that were happening and to talk to people about those events to see how they made sense of them. It could be ordinary events. It could be highly uh, challenging events. The uh, somebody was evicted. There's a fire. Somebody was shot, or it could be you know somebody um, somebody had a baby. Whatever it happens to be that looking at events and looking at people's way of making talking about them and making them meaningful helped me to come up with this observation, which is that most of us in sociology look at the poor as a kind of static object. They're kind of outside of history, right? History is for those in the middle class or the upper class who are, who are moving and progressing and, and doing all sorts of wonderful things. Those people are quote unquote stuck. That was the prevailing view. And I used this idea of an event-based mode of uncovering their history to try and show that there's a lot of change here. There's a lot of ways in which this is also a dynamic community even though we tend to look at it as existing outside of time. So that's something that a lot of people who read Gang Leader don't know. But um, I like to mention because it was certainly influential in how I thought about my work. And then in terms of Gang Leader itself, it was a mix of both participant observations and, and interviews as well then? <laughs> Loosely so. Um, most of the I, – I, I did very few interviews that – you would think of as formal sit down tape recorded conversations of the kind that we're having now. So most of the interviews that I ended up doing were in the form of conversations in the moment that, and it's close to the moment. So this is why I brought up this kind of event based moment. So as soon as someone experiences something, uh, try to get them to talk about it um, and see how they make sense of it. So it wasn't, it wasn't often interviews that were set up well in advance. It was trying to take people who were in the middle of an event and then take them out and have them reflect on it. Yeah. And then one of the things that people often ask is they see the title and assume this is a short piece of research, but we're talking about 10 years almost you were with the, the group. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, I started in 1989 and then, um, I have been with many of those people in the book, those who are still alive since uh, until, you know, 2014, 15, 16. So it was a continuous project. The gang leader represented about 10 years of that work. Yeah. And do you just want to explain why the, the gang leader for a day, where that title came from? Because that's, that's a bit more specific about something that you did, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, so I was challenged at one point by the leader of the, the gang that was I, I was hanging out with JT to try and um, you know I, I said I told him I didn't I didn't really think his job was that difficult because he didn't really do that much or it didn't seem that he was doing that much he was walking around you know acting in a cavalier manner um, seemed to almost like a mafioso mafioso figure in a movie or something but I my 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 understanding of leadership was or management was that somebody was sitting behind a desk processing papers. And so he said, well, why don't, you, why don't you just try this for a day? And, and I mean, 
talk about the how much you know talk about the old adage you know if you, if you really want to understand someone's life walk in their shoes step in their shoes i mean that was it um that really gave me a uh immediate tactile sense of what it what it meant i mean i tried not to i don't think i did anything that was highly dangerous but just just even having him turn to me in some of the decisions that he had to make um and ask me what would you do put me in the situation of having to think and empathize with this person that i was being with in a way that i hadn't done that before amazing amazing what were your kind of overall conclusions you know you spent such a long period of time with this group what what do you kind of conclude in terms of your study of the robert taylor holmes um some of my conclusions are might be global in the sense of they're about human behavior and so one thing that i'm always struck by is it people generally want to be seen as an expert of their world there's a lot of dignity and value that comes with the feeling that you have a craft and and by that i don't mean that you can make shoes you know you're a, or you're a tailor or a cobbler or what have you i don't mean that only i, I mean that you feel like the your your profession is also your vocation it's something that comes very naturally to you so why do i say it like that well because for a community that has been just denigrated so much the urban poor it's sometimes hard to see just how much people are seeking that level of dignity in their life so here we have these people in a street gang and from an outside view you can't help but wonder why would you put yourself in that position so much risk and yes we can explain a lot of it by the lack of opportunities that exist so it's really you know the, the other opportunities that exist might be a, a, a low wage job that in you know, a fast food restaurant or that looks just very meaningless i think it also has to do with this sense of um empower empowerment or the sense of the feeling of being in control that a lot of those kids have and all those young people have by doing that kind of work they are controlling their life they know how to do that work now it's illegal it's dangerous i'm not dismissing any of that but i think one of the hardest things for us to talk about as social science when people are in very adverse circumstances is to really is to, is to look at the reasons why they're doing it that are not purely criminal uh, not purely deviant because those are our ways of looking at it so i think one of the things that i keep coming back to as a challenge is trying to insert that voice and to talk about people who as as folks who have wanted to be an expert in their their world and to bring some of that psychology into our discussions of the urban poor. Yeah. So you ended up empathizing, understanding exactly their behavior? I, I hope so. I, the other part of it that was important for me was not to see it as a behavior of people in and of itself. Like it wasn't an isolated community. It was profoundly impacted by the institutions in the wider society. So the other part that I hope that I was able to achieve in the writings at that period of time was to help people to understand that this is a community that is an American community. It is not a community that is isolated from other American institutions, the press, the economy, the political structure, etc. Thank you, Sudan. Thank you. The students are, and, and listeners are really going to enjoy hearing about that. And I thought it might be an opportunity for you to mention some of your other publications and books as well. So if people have read Gang Leader and enjoyed it, what else could they uh, look into? Uh, well, I, after Gang Leader, I spent my time trying to understand the workings of the underground economy. And the book that I wrote at that time was called Off the Books. Um, so that was a, I'm sorry, that was a before Gang Leader, excuse me. And that was, that was a view into the, the, the ways in which a, an economy is structured in a poor community, um, the daily life of people who work illegally. It doesn't always have to be sex work and drugs, et cetera. It could be people who are making food and selling it under the table. You know, how does an economy like that run? So that's off the books. And then I wrote one book about New York called Floating City, in which I looked at the intersection of the life, the lives, excuse me, of the wealthy and the very poor in, the, in New York City. Thank you, Sudan. Thank you so much. And if people want to find out a little bit more about what you do um how can they get in touch do you have a website or and you use twitter as well 
I have uh, been using Twitter more frequently in the last year or so, but I'm also on my website at, at, at I have a website at Columbia University in sociology and my email is there. People should be um, free to, um, you're welcome to, to reach out. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time today, Sadeo. I really, really appreciate it. Absolutely. It was great Thank speaking. You. Thank you. If you are a regular listener to The Sociology Show, then you could help with the costs of promoting and hosting the podcast. If you can spare even a small amount, then you can donate on the GoFundMe.com website by searching for The Sociology Show. There is no obligation, of course, and all future downloads will continue to be free. A huge thank you to all those that have already donated. Your kind gesture will help to continue keep the show going and growing. Best wishes and keep enjoying the show. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the podcast. If you would like to contact the show or be interviewed, then please email the Sociology Show Podcast at gmail.com.